what came through to me in rewatching some episodes recently is these people are stuck in a nexus. It's almost kind of like a Hieronymus Bosch vision of like you can't, they can't they make these efforts to break free, mm-hmm. but then by the end you've got Meadows saying, "Well, I'm going to go work for." do this kind of law because you know Italians are oppressed and she knows that everyone around her is incredibly corrupt yeah, and yeah. violent yeah, yeah. Right. and you know um, Carmela has made endless compromises and you know give give the, you know AJ a, a BMW and suddenly the all the world issues aren't as important and so these people mm. The greater the betrayal of Tony's, the larger the present he gets her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and she's and fine with that. And it's yeah. all about, um, are, are we fine with the compromises they make? Like, we have mm. to, there are people who are not willing to engage or not comfortable with engaging the fact that a lot of the show is an indictment of the lies people tell themselves about mm-hmm. the compromises that they make. And that's hard to bear you know and so that's the reason the show was a huge hit for six seasons because he took this trope of the mobster thing and used it as like a subversive vehicle to get in all this existential <laughs> yeah. stuff about but we're all in our own trapped in our own mafia i was going to say to what extent are all of us in bed with the mob you know yeah. in some sense what are we all have our own different versions of it probably and there's a huge there's an incredible darkness to that but i do i, I think i have revised you know my view of uh, how Chase viewed the people or viewed the situation, sometimes he airs them with a kind of bemused fascination. Yeah. And sometimes he air- views them with um, a kind of disgusted um, pessimism. And so you can't boil that down to one thing. He, he really goes between those, there, there, are, there are those, but he's always got a certain detached view of them which again it can be amused or it can be it sad is, it is and it's a tone that reminds me of the tone of certain filmmakers who also have that sensibility like Bunuel and uh, Todd Salance a lot of The Sopranos reminds me of a Todd Salance like a welcome to the dollhouse happiness mm-hmm. kind of sense of humor and and fonder and, though I would say yeah and particularly Meadow who I think we're we're meant to understand I mean yeah. Chase has a daughter she was on the show usually as a fuck up right uh, and she does show up in the last two episodes and she's like pulled it together and yeah she's in, she's her in second med year of med school yeah. right um but i there is a certain fondness that he has for some characters and i think also there's something about Polly that is like vibrating on a different frequency yes i can't say why I no mean, my favorite moment of the finale and me watching it has been over the years has been um Polly hates that stupid cat that they somehow acquired when they're on the run. Yeah. This animal is but out of here just, today. But there's just, as a filmmaker, Chase is so, like, he just gets it. Like, you know, you, you in Alan's book and elsewhere, he makes these references to, like, classic, you know, Italian films and just, like, the, the, the yeah. new wave and all this kind of stuff. And to me, what makes it all so worthwhile, I mean, there's a lot of things, the performances, a lot of dif- his affection for the characters, but there's this moment at the, in the finale where... Um, Polly's sitting outside with his little son and then the reflector, <laughs> and the cat just like <laughs> flops down on the pavement. And he, he just holds the shot because I think he does. He's conflicted about the audience. He's conflicted about how he cares these people, but there's some aspect of this world he really loves, and he just lingers on that shot for a minute. And I yeah. just I kind of enjoyed the hell out of that. Yeah, and definitely. then a shot previous to that where he's about to broom the cat. <laughs> that guy Walden is like lifting. He's like, leave it. Who cares? He catches mice, and like, this animal leaves today. And he's got the broom, and then Tony comes in. <laughs> yeah. Well. It, you know, we do. T- I, I think because it's such a dark, violent show, we do tend to forget that it is at its heart a comedy. It is at its heart a comedy, and with a, with a very strong satirical yeah. streak. And like, and it manifests itself in these wonderful, really tiny, tiny throwaway, like almost like fast forward sight gags. Like I think it's in the last episode where <laughs> you see, chi- you know, Chinatown. Anybody who's lived yeah. in New York knows that Little Italy has been basically completely taken over by Chinatown. And 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 uh, th- there's that tour bus that is rocketing through Little yeah. Italy, and you hear the guy, the tour guide, t- t- you know, telling them about Little Italy, but they're, it looks like they're doing about 45 miles an hour because there's nothing to see, <laughs> which, you know, plays into, you know, your idea. of restaurants, yeah. Right, the, you know, the glorious past that never was. Sure. You know. I also tend to give, over the years, I've tried to give shows more slack about the way they end things because of all the means. We've talked about film, we've talked about books. It's one of the, the hardest to control 
every aspect yeah. as you're going along. How, who knows how what the show would have done if uh, if Olivia, Olivia Soprano had been around longer, things like right. that. You can right. look at it one of two ways. One is that art should not reflect life in terms of it should be a cleaner version or should say something, or it should right. reflect the messiness of it. And sometimes yeah. things you think there's going to be a build up to something and it, it dissipates before you even get there. How you view television in that way will obviously affect how you're going to view a show like The Sopranos, which was interested a lot of times in just these very small stories mm-hmm. yes. that may be added to something whole, if nothing else, just filled out the world and that was okay. Well, and there was there's also, when I talk to people about television who maybe don't know that much about how television is made, there's a uh, there's a set of misconceptions about the about storytelling on TV, and they think that it's like a movie or it's like a novel, and and when you get an ongoing show that has a lot of uh, inter- tightly interwoven plot lines, and they're wondering how are these going to pay off, they say, do you think they have a plan? No. Do do, you, do they know what they're doing, or are they just making it up as they go along? And it's like uh, if you know how TV is made, you know that they are making it up as they go along. Then maybe they go into it with a plan. Maybe they have a general outline. They've got 10 or 12 or 22 episodes mapped out, and they know kind of we want to start here and end here, but then things happen. Maybe they cast a particular person in a part who's not working, and they realize we got to get rid of this guy. Let's, let's whack him, mm-hmm. or let's have him go to prison, and we're going to replace him with a different character. Or maybe this, this antagonist that we've chosen is not as interesting as we thought, which is what happened in season three of Breaking Bad. Yep. Mm-hmm. The cousins, and, and uh, they were simply not interesting enough to, to be at the center of an entire season of Breaking Bad, and so they had to make a change. A, and it took uh, them in a more interesting direction. just did this, this season. Mm-hmm. That yeah. they, and that goes back to what we were talking about before, about how much input viewers mm-hmm. should have, because my uh, non-carnal work spouse, Tara Ariano, and I were talking about, she's like, look, I'm happy to get rid of... Um, uh, Kalinda's husband, because uh, Nick, because it's just not working. The actor is not good. It's yeah. not credible that she would be in this guy's like sexual thrall or anyone's. Like she is the thrall. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> but uh, she's everyone's thrall. Yeah. But um, Tara was like, I don't like. I'm just not comfortable. Even though the end result is good, yeah. I'm not comfortable with this stated reason which is the viewers are really not responding to this so we're writing them off like that she's like don't don't give people ideas like if that's the reason great but don't don't tell us that don't make us think we have control over it um so you have to wonder like you have to wonder how often that's the motivation for getting rid of various characters and we never hear about it Mm -hmm. who was the guy on sopranos that like robert lozier yeah couldn't learn his lines and they're like we're gonna we're gonna violate his parole because right because this can't continue. Yeah, you know? well, was, there was that one scene where he's, like, speechifying at the card game. Apparently, it took him, like, three days to shoot it because it's right. just impossible. And you run into these problems, though. And in a way, like, making a television show is like uh, like making a Mike Lee or Robert Altman movie yeah. in, in that maybe you, you sort of know what the story is, but you're kind of also finding it. Mm-hmm. Well, the flip side of what you're saying is that you also, if you over plan, you don't allow yourself to find the happy mistakes. Right. Yeah. And this right. is what frustrates me about... Um, but you're just making it up as you go. Isn't that the best possible answer? It's awesome. Answer? Yeah. It's awesome. Because then you get season five of 24 when they're like, we're just going to do 24. What? What's happening over here? We got the Nixon White House. How did that happen? Yeah. And they just were like, let's just do that. And they just made a complete. And sometimes you sort of like hear the machinery like. Well, like, but that's what, yeah. that's what makes TV <laughs> so exciting. Well, it's a exciting. giant cruise ship trying to turn. <laughs> I think there might be a sort of like, not class resentment exactly. But I think people who know enough about how TV is made to know that everyone's getting paid a lot more than, you know, we proles are to watch it. Right. They're like, I want to know that you have a plan and that you are working 19 and a half hours a day on your plan. Yeah. Yeah. But they I just want don't want to hear, wanna hear how many different things have an impact on that plan. And if you're David Chase yeah. and you're HBO, your plan is the plan. If you're David right. Simon, your plan is the only plan. If yeah. you're anyone else, maybe yeah. David Milch, the three David, Holy Trinity. Yeah, the David. They David, can David, just yeah. do their thing. But even with Milch, the most recent series, Luck, they I have had feeling they, Milch's plan is going to. They have bla- a bunch they, of they they changed the plan, and he was not allowed to just hand. On. Oh. actors script pages hot off the presses but anyone else you have the studio you have the network you have actors you have um you know uh any Agents, number of different figures and practices well and there's Huge also numbers the of people putting in so that we've come up with this auteur the air service <laughs> table, <you know>? right <laughs> there's this auteur theory of television now which is kind of great and which alan's book goes into in some detail but even there it becomes very clear that 
In some extremely rare outlier cases, there is an auteur who controls most, if not all, aspects of things, but that is incredibly rare. And even they live in this echo chamber. And I was going to say, I would feedback. disagree with the word. The only part yeah. of that that I would disagree with is the word control. Because they, they're, they're more in a lot of, in a sense, they're more uh, impresarios or they're kind of presiding over accidents. Absolutely. Uh,